Guys, everybody good? Everybody hanging in there? It's been a heavy week, hasn't it? I don't know about you, it's been heavy for me. Every once in a while, there, there comes a time where things just change the world as we know it, right? And with what's been happening in Israel, I, I, every morning I'm waking up and signing on to news or my homepage on my computer wondering what has happened next or what, what new has transpired, if anything. And I, and I kind of wait and I hold my breath and go, man, life is short Life is hard at times, and uh, may we just continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Israel. Um, I had a gathering with youth workers on Thursday. About 30 of us gathered together um, for encouragement, support, vision casting for our churches. And uh, I just think it's so important to be able to communicate, uh, especially to this generation of teenagers where um, they need to know why what is happening in Israel is so important and why it matters even to them as teenagers. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it's just important to know that there is good and evil in this world, that God always keeps his promises, and nothing has surprised the Lord in the last eight days, right? He... <laughs> He didn't wake up and go, whoa, what's going on there? God is in control. He has been in control. But may we continue to lift our brothers and sisters uh, in Christ up as God will continue to fulfill his prom promises. Uh, that is true. And in the midst of that, let's do our part to pray and bring encouragement and support for those uh, who are hiding. We get to gather today. Nobody's, nobody snuck in today, right? We didn't have to run in uh, in the shadows, through the bushes, we parked our car, we walked in, we saw the sun and the sky, and we, I hope, thank the Lord as we came together to worship him together in freedom without fear. Amen? Amen. Um, with all that being said, that's, that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, but I feel like we need to remember and acknowledge uh, our brothers and sisters. Um, who desperately could use the prayer support. So let me start with that, and then I'll dive in. Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are holy. You are the name above every other name on the planet. And Father God, be near to those who need you, which is all of humanity. Be close to your people and bring encouragement to them. Bring freedom to your people and Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm the country of Israel with your presence in their lives, with your love for them and the fulfilling of your promises. God, you are good and you are in control, and we acknowledge that and just pray for that comfort and encouragement for those around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I'm going to take you back to Memorial Day weekend of 2011. I don't know if you remember what you were doing. My guess is probably not. Um, but tonight, as I take you back to that weekend, I want to let you know that the message is going to look and feel a little bit different than a typical message or sermon, if you will. Um, tonight's going to be a story, and it's a story from my life, a true story of a situation that took place on that weekend. And as I share this story, I'll take a break once or twice just to kind of check in, see how you're doing, and give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to maybe bring something to the surface in your own life. So on this weekend in 2011, um, my wife and I were headed up to my in-law's cabin just in the Lutzen Tofty area. They have a little slice of heaven that the Lord blessed them with right there on Lake Superior and nothing on either side of them for about 50 yards. Whatever you picture the Three Bears Cottage to look like in your mind, that's precisely what it is. Nice little cabin, solitude, it's got a loft inside and just a beautiful place where my family likes to go a minimum of once a year. But this particular weekend was pre-kids for us 
and we were going to be joined with my two brother-in-laws. So for those of you who maybe don't know or you haven't met my wife, here's a picture of my wife and I together. Um, Molly has an alias, if you have not heard that. She goes by the name of the uh, cheese ball chick, um, bringing joy to the world one cheese ball at a time. So that's what that contraption is in front of her. And the two other main characters in this story are Molly's older brother, Andy, and her younger brother, Jeff. And here's a picture of them. Uh, Andy is uh, the shorter on our left, and Jeff is the younger and taller on our right. That picture was taken at Jeff's wedding just a couple of years ago. So we're headed up to the North Shore, and we're going to hang out with my two brother-in-laws that weekend. And it was a cold and dreary weekend, probably upper 40s, and misting and raining off and on throughout our entire trip up. Now, on Saturday, we went up on Friday. On Saturday, my two brother-in-laws were determined to go fishing. They had their hearts set on fishing in Andy's little uh, aluminum fishing boat that he brought with. Rain or shine, that's what we were going to do. Now, I would have preferred just to stay inside the nice little cozy cabin. However, I'm relatively new to the family. These are my brand new brother-in-laws. I want to get to know them a little bit deeper. I don't want them to think I'm a wuss. So I said, sure, I'll join the crew fishing. So we layered about every single article of clothing that we had brought with us. Because like I said, it was cold and it was dreary and it was wet. So we had winter coats on. We had a homemade rain gear made out of garbage bags and duct tape, which we put around our legs and arms and other places. Um, We probably looked like uh, an overweight version of the Ghostbusters and their jumpsuits as we uh, piled into the car. So we took about a 10-minute drive north on Highway 61, and we turned west away from Lake Superior on a gravel road. That lasted about 30 minutes on this gravel road with washboards in the middle. So we are just going like this on the wooden roller coaster at Valley Fair for 30 minutes until we finally come to some sort of civilization. But let me just say we are in the boondocks. I don't know what the name of the road was that we were on, but I'm pretty sure it was called Bob Bob's Road. And I feel like maybe I saw a sign for Camp Crystal Lake on my way. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we get to this landing of sorts, and I see one other car. So I know we're not alone. But I still have not seen anyone in the last 45 minutes or so. Um, we situated ourselves um, as we backed the boat out into the, uh, the launch area, and... Andy is is getting the things from the trunk, throwing them into his car, um, and and we we pull the car away. We begin to set the boat out, and Jeff, six foot four, two hundred fifteen pounds or so, he snagged the best seat at the front of the boat, and at the front of the boat, the seat I'm referring to is a swivel office chair that Andy had bolted to the bow. Okay, so. Some, some MacGyvering here of the boat that we're in to begin with. Molly and I sat in the middle on the benches, and Andy, he was the one that was going to man his trolling motor, brand new trolling motor at the rear. Now, it's important that we take a little inventory of what's in the boat at this time. We've got the small trolling motor that Andy just purchased there at the back, uh, along with another motor, just in case we wanted to open it up later and go a little faster, a brand new boat battery. There, of course, was the gas tank to put the, feed the fuel to uh, the motor. We had fishing poles for all of us, a tackle box with Andy's $600 fake tooth in it. So let me back up. A few years prior to this uh, endeavor, Andy, uh, got, he got punched in the face and lost his tooth. Now, that's a whole nother story, but 
He was somewhere he probably shouldn't have been doing things that he probably shouldn't have been doing when he got punched in the face, lost his tooth. So he had this retainer that he would push up, and he had this fake tooth. Well, he didn't want to lose, because it was falling out, he didn't want to lose his $600 tooth, so he put that in the tackle, tackle box, sealed the tackle box, and set it at the bottom of the boat. And we had a, a family size bag of mini M&Ms. All right? So that's what we have on our journey. Once we get the boat out, we waste no time getting our lines out into the water, but very quickly, Andy grew tired of the spot that we had chosen right there out in the middle of the lake. We see no other boats uh, on the lake, no sources of civilization besides the one car that was parked there at the launch as we set out. It's cold, it's dreary, it's miserable. Andy decides we don't like, he doesn't like the spot. Let's open up the motor and let's go try somebody someplace new after about five minutes. Well, as the speed of the boat increases, we notice droplets of water spraying over the front of the boat. And there with my six foot four, 215 pound brother-in-law at the bow, the boat began to take a nosedive. And as it seems, the boat is about to flip. I yell at Andy to turn off the motor, because I don't want it to fly off and like slap chop one of us on the way down, which is what seemed to be happening. And before you could yell cannonball, the boat had completely submerged and we found ourselves struggling to breathe with the cold water compressing our chest and trying to breathe in the icy cold water. What didn't help the situation was all of this thick clothing and plastic bags that we had on, which began to take on more and more water and pull us down. As the reality of the situation now set in with an overturned boat and us in the water, we became desperate to locate the life jackets. They should be popping up out of the water from underneath the boat at any moment. Andy, Andy, where are the life jackets? No words were necessary. If Andy was a dog, his tail would be between his legs as he gave the most pathetic look of shame and regret that I had ever seen. In his excitement and exuberance to get out onto the water, he had forgotten all the life jackets in the trunk of the car. So with no flotation devices, our only hope is to cling to the sides of the overturned boat. We decided that we were going to try to work together and, and push and pull the overturned boat to shore, which was well over the length of a football field away. We're pushing, we're pulling, we're struggling, and making little to no progress. It's at this point where my wife, Molly, decided she was going to go rogue, leave the boys to try to handle the boat, and she was going to swim for the shore. And and it's at this moment where I think to myself, is this going to be the last time that I see my wife? She's going off on her own. But Molly felt confident because she is a former uh, a lifeguard. She was confident that she could somehow make it in a winter coat, gloves, hat, three shirts, two pairs of pants, two pairs of socks, tennis shoes on, again, garbage bags around both her legs and feet. Again, she used to be a lifeguard, she thought. So she begins to swim away, and meanwhile, back at the boat, we realize, us three guys, we're not, we're not budging the boat. We're not moving. We're not making any progress whatsoever. Because unbeknownst to us, the anchor had fallen off. Forgot to mention there's an anchor on the boat, had fallen off, and we were trying to push the boat as the anchor drug across the bottom of the lake, preventing us from going anywhere. We were hopelessly and needlessly exhausting ourselves by pushing and pulling on an anchored vessel. At one point, I remember there at the back of the boat, 
Jeff and I trying to push this thing as we kicked our legs, and, and, and it got about, Jeff got about 10 feet away from the boat. He gave it a shove, pushed himself away from it, and I looked at his face, and it just turned white as a ghost. And I'm looking at him, and I see the exhaustion on his face, and at that point, I thought I was about to lose my brother-in-law. About the same time that we realize what's happening there with the boat, my wife is having a realization of her own. She was literally drowning. Basically, because she refused to let go of all of those things that was holding her back. In her head, uh, I, I, sometimes I try to get in her head, and this is one of those situations where I, I, it just didn't make sense to me, but in her mind, she wanted to hang on to those things. She didn't want to lose her jacket. She didn't want to lose her, her, her clothes, her jeans, and all of these things. But the irony is it was those very things that she was holding on to that she didn't want to get rid of that were pulling her under, that were literally in that moment sucking her life away. And as I think about that scenario, it makes me think of a passage in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. Otherwise, we'll put them up on the screen as well. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. Here's what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run or in our case swim with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Friends, uh, I just want to pause from the story for a moment and ask you this. What are the things in your life that you need to throw off? What are the things that you are holding on to which is preventing you from living life the way God intended, from doing the, the front crawl with energy and, and reckless abandon? What are the things that you're holding on to? You know they're holding you back. You know they're unhealthy. And maybe tonight is the moment and the opportunity that you've been waiting for to just say, I, 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 I choose to throw it off. I choose to let go. I know there's a lot of people holding on to anxiety, fear of the unknown. And it, it's, it's that fear preventing them from living the life that God intends them to live. Maybe there's some resentment in your life. There's that fear in your life. Maybe your life is completely out of control because you are saying yes to way too many things. You're holding on to this overcommitted life and you're giving yourself partially to many things but not fully in to really much of anything maybe you're holding on to some bitterness because of what somebody did or some situation that happened to you in your life but rather than me throw out every possible scenario I just want to pause and and give us a moment to ask the Lord a question and then just to be still and listen. Let's just ask the Lord this question. Lord, is there anything that I'm holding on to that you want me to throw off? And then let's just listen. Father God, I just pray right now through your Holy Spirit that you would pierce our hearts, that we would hear from you from the God who is above all things, who is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, who sees the big picture, who knows what has been, who knows what is to come, is there anything I am holding on to that I need to throw off?
Did you hear it? If so, it's up to you to be faithful to what God has called you to do. You say, Craig, I can't do it on my own. Well, then you're in the right place because you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. So Jeff got a burst of adrenaline enabling him to get that 10 feet back to the boat and grab on to the boat to keep him above the water. And after a brief rest, he got a second wind. At that point, he abandoned the boat as well, leaving Andy and I there together. But just before he did, he threw off everything that would have held him back. He stripped down to his boxer shorts. He safely rolled his wallet and his car keys into a bundle of wet clothes on top of the boat, and he took off for the shore. At this point... My wife believes that God must have sent a boatload of angels her direction to literally drag her in because as she is reaching the shore, she has this realization. She has doubled her weight in water and looks like a dying Oompa Loompa there on the shore or a beached whale as she arrives. And after taking a moment for her to catch her breath because Jeff was relatively unhindered, shortly there arrived at the shore behind her, they decided to take off in the direction where they thought the boat launch was. There were no trails in this, this thick wooded area, so they blazed their own tra trail. So picture this. My wife, still wearing every single article of clothing she started with, and Jeff leading the way in his underwear through the woods. Back at the boat... I'm the last one standing, rather treading water. I'm the last one standing because now Andy has opted to swim to shore as well. And I'm just thinking, I, I, got, I, I have nothing to prove. <laughs> I have nothing to prove. I'm going to stay here uh, with the boat. So Andy swims to shore, but on his way there, so he gets about halfway, decides he needs to throw off everything holding him back. So... Halfway there, he drops his shoes and his pants on the way. So there I am, shivering, sitting on top of the boat. After 30 minutes of yelling for help at the top of my lungs, I think I hear a motor off in the distance. And I do. I stand on top of the boat and... and, and Two-thirds of a mile away, coming around the bend, I see a pontoon boat. Can't imagine what they must have been thinking with me standing on top of the boat, Andy swimming in for shore as I'm waving my arms back and forth. And as my, my rescuers pull up to assess the situation, we decide we're going <laughs> to, I'm going to get in the pontoon, I'm going to hold on to the boat with a rope. We're going to pull that into Andy, pick him up, and then go back to the boat launch. And when we got back to the boat launch, now we've got to get back into the water, flip the boat upside down, and we are hoping and we are praying that we are going to find the items like trapped underneath that Andy had just spent on. As a matter of fact, those fishing poles he had borrowed from a friend of his, nice, expensive fishing poles. Well, we got it flipped over, and uh, Jeff and Molly arrived back at the scene. Um, we're hoping to find the fishing poles. We're hoping to find the brand-new battery. We're hoping to find the trolling motor. We're hoping to find the tackle box with the $600 tooth inside. We're hoping to find the family size bag of uh, mini M&Ms, but all those things were gone. Not only were all those things gone, our cell phones were destroyed Molly's brand spanking new digital camera she had received as a gift, gone, destroyed. The good news is Andy had the foresight to remove the car key from his pants before he ditched them in the middle of the lake. The bad news is, although he grabbed the car keys, he forgot his wallet, which was in the back pocket, which had a couple hundred dollars in cash, 
a whole bunch of credit cards, his identification, uh, among other treasures that he desperately needed. So, with no spare clothes in the car and only one pair of dry rubber waders in the back of uh, the trunk, Molly decided to wear those and made a very fascinating fashion statement in those oversized overalls. And the rest of us, the three gentlemen, drove back to the cabin in our underwear. So, I had personally had all the adventure that I needed for one weekend. I was good. Uh, I had a a great memory that I could share. I lived to tell the story. But very quickly when we got back into the car, the conversation went from what just happened to here's what we're going to do next. Here's the plan. All right? So Molly and her two brothers were absolutely determined to go back to the lake to recover all of their lost goods and especially Andy's tooth. Right? That was number one on the list. I let them know at that point, if they were seriously thinking about going back to the lake the next day, I would hold down the fort at the cabin and provide them with some much needed prayer support on their expedition. So the next morning is when I witnessed the Barnhart sibling shenanigans at their finest. Jeff is in the yard crafting a a, a device consisting of a yard rake duct taped to a broom handle for extra length to comb the bottom of the lake. Andy is down at the shore of Lake Superior looking for a large rock to bring with. Because Andy believes in his mind that like in a Saturday morning cartoon, that if he could borrow a face mask or some goggles from a nearby resort, which he did, he could hold the rock, which would lower him to the bottom of the lake, allowing him to walk across the bottom of the lake while he used the cabin's garden hose to breathe through, which his siblings would be holding up in the boat. So, what I'm about to tell you is what was told to me. I was not there. Remember, I was fasting and praying back at the cabin, but this is what I was told, and this is what I pictured in my mind as they arrived back at the lake. They had some wetsuits, so Andy and Jeff put on the wetsuits and securely, this time, had life jackets in the boat. They trolled out onto the lake. They let down the yard rake. They combed the bottom of the lake with this flimsy redneck contraption, hoping to snag one of the fishing poles, and they actually did. They grabbed a pole, which gave them hope. Now, Andy and Jeff were convinced that they had found the spot where the boat went down. But Molly had a sinking feeling that they were wrong, that they were not in the right location. And the reason Molly felt the way that she did is because she had some confidence which rested in, the, in an image ingrained in her mind from the day before. It happened to be some birch branches extending out over the water. She says it was kind of as if they were reaching out to her. She says she remembers fixing her eyes on those birch branches and that fallen birch tree where she had nearly drowned the day before. That birch tree had become her finish line, and now, 24 hours later, it had become her reference point. But they were nowhere near the birch tree. So she explained her reasoning, but like brothers sometimes do, disregarded her suggestion and insisted on searching on the area where they found that fishing pole. So, Andy is ready to try his rock-holding, goggle-wearing, garden hose-breathing idea. Andy tried and tried and finally gave up on the fourth or fifth attempt where Jeff had accidentally, like like a a bad cartoon uh, or comedy, had taken the hose, was holding the hose as Andy was trying to, to, to breathe underwater, came up gargling and gasping for breath, and Jeff looked over the other side of the boat and noticed he actually was holding it in the water on the other side. (laughs) So that wasn't working. They realized that the only way that they could actually reach the bottom is by diving from the boat 
when they had a little air in their lungs and, and try to rely on their hands to feel along the bottom. So after over an hour of draining themselves with dives from the boats and blind searches through the muck 12 feet below, they finally agreed to pull up the anchor and head to the area near the birch trees where Molly had suggested. Molly talks about praying and praying that God would direct their dives and, and the sweeping motions of their hands in the rake. And, and Andy was ready to try in the new spot as Jeff and Molly waited there in the boat. So he dove from the front of the boat on the first dive, went down into the water, and it was only seconds until Andy came back up. His right hand triumphantly rose from the water, clinching the bag of family-sized mini M&Ms. <laughs> and in the other hand, the tackle box still completely sealed. Brought it in the boat, $600 tooth inside, and all the contents. They recovered the battery. They recovered Andy's pants and his wallet with his credit cards, ID, and money inside. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 2 tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. And there are times and there are moments in this world where we are so easily distracted by other things. We fix our eyes on so many other things other than Jesus himself. So let me ask, in those moments, in those struggles, in those hard times, when you are struggling to survive, when you feel like you're doing nothing but treading water, you're just trying to keep your head up, what is it that orients you? What is your point of reference. For my wife, she was focused on that birch tree. It was a fixture, it was stable, it was secure, and Jesus does that for us. Jesus does that for us. He extends his arm towards you in the rough waters of your life. But the question is, will you look to him? Are you looking to him? He overcame sin through death on the cross, and there is great, incredible, unbelievable treasure for those who fix their eyes on him. He is the most reliable reference point that we have. So let me ask you another question. What are you focused on other than Jesus? What are you focused on that maybe has taken your life off course or, or a scenic route that you don't need to be on right now. In your heart, you know where you ought to be, but you're diving through the muck and losing sight of what is most important in life. Instead of fixing your eyes on Jesus, the most important thing in life, you're fixated on a career. You're fixated on academics, athletics, electronics, likes on social media. Maybe you're fixated on winning arguments, always being right, fitting in, blaming others, being perfect, or the persona of living a perfect life. I tell this to students all the time, and I tell this to families, um, because we live 
in a society that prioritizes academics and athletics and the spiritual well-being of an individual is a distant, distant third place. Academics are wonderful and athletics are great, but without Jesus at the end of a person's life, you end up being an intellectual athlete separated for God from God for all of eternity. And you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? What are my eyes fixed on? Better to be an uncoordinated dunce in heaven than an intellectual athlete in hell. And those things are not bad in of themselves, but when we fixate on anything other than our relationship with Jesus, it becomes idolatry. Anytime we pursue something or we focus on something more than our relationship with Jesus, it becomes idolatry. So the celebration of the siblings echoed across the waters as they found these treasures. Molly's brothers apologized for not listening to her sooner, and they all praised and thanked God for his provision and protection from the day before. Uh, we gave Andy a nickname that weekend. We call him Mr. Tooth and Tackle. And we thank God for the birch tree, which had become that precious point of reference. On Memorial Day weekends of 2011, we called out to God literally to save our lives. Many years earlier, uh, I called on the name of Jesus to save my soul. I had become aware that my sin and my choices separated me from God and destined me for eternity apart from him and his presence. And so I simply did what Romans 10, 9 says, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. It's not about going to church. It's not about um, saying your prayers. It's not about reading the Bible. All those things are wonderful. But Romans 10, 9 cuts to the chase. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. So I'm going to invite the uh, worship team to come back up. And I don't know what it is that um, you most needed to hear tonight. We all have stories where we look back and say, man, there is no other reason that I should be here except for God and God alone. His grace, his provision, his kindness, his love. So let me just encourage you with these things. Number one, throw off the things of this world that are holding you back. Tonight, don't carry it any longer. Leave it in this room and walk away from it as far as the east is from the west. May tonight be a turning point for you and your relationship with Jesus. Number two, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. We live in a world full of distractions. There are things that we run after and things that we pursue that we are never meant to run after. So if you've veered off course, if you're taking an unnecessary scenic route, put your eyes on Jesus. Keep them fixed on Jesus, no matter what the day brings. And finally, if you have never cried out to Jesus, I'm not talking in a moment of a near-death experience, but truly repented and put your faith and trust in Jesus, cried out to him to save you. I'm here to tell you he's the only one that can. He's the only one that can. I don't know about you, but I think it's an offer I can't refuse. I can't tread through life on my own, trying to do it on my own, trying to make it on my own, trying to pursue other things and other relationships other than Jesus and Jesus alone. So Father God, we thank you for who you are Thank you for loving us, for saving us, for the gift of salvation that you give to each and every one of us. And Lord, I just pray if there's anyone who has not stepped into that, 
that they would do exactly precisely what Romans 10, 9 says, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in their heart that you were raised from the dead and Lord, that you would write their name in the book of life now and for all of eternity. God, I pray that today would be a turning point for many of us to get back on track, to keep our eyes on you and to throw off the things that are weighing us down. Pray this in Jesus' name.